to expect to get the world record. So that's super exciting. Uh, a few logistical items. All the participants are gonna be on mute to make sure that everybody has a great experience. However, we do wanna hear from you guys. So at the bottom of the Zoom, you'll see a Q&A component. Feel free and use that to ask questions and we'll take those questions later in the segment. Uh, the tasting is gonna go for 45 minutes. Then we're gonna have a 15 minute Q&A and then some final closing comments. Um, we're also recording the event. We'll be sending the link out on Friday so that everybody can watch it at your place. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about why we're having this event and the importance of what we're doing here tonight. Um, Parkinson's disease, unfortunately, is a growth industry. It's doubling every 25 years. There's a million people in the U.S. living with Parkinson's, and just in the event time tonight, 29 people will be newly diagnosed with the disease. Um, there's a lot of hope also. 10 years ago, there were no disease-modifying drugs in the pipeline. Now there's over 40. So what we're doing here tonight by raising awareness and raising funds for research is making a tremendous difference. Now together we've raised over $33,000, which is incredible, and we're still going. And we're gonna try something new tonight. It's something new to us and it's something new to Zoom. It's called Pledgeling. And it's an overlay in Zoom that you can donate during the event. And I'm really excited to announce that I'm gonna actually match dollar for dollar all the donations made through Pledgeling tonight up to $6,000. So check that out and uh, go easy on us. It's, it's a new thing for us. So we're hoping that it works um, fairly well. Um, now, also our friends at Wine Insiders have graciously extended the discount on the wine packs through the weekend. So feel free, load up, buy some for your friends and the donations are gonna still come through again through the weekend. All right, enough of me talking. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce these amazing sommeliers we have here with us this evening. So starting with Aaron, Aaron, take it away. Thanks, Bill. Um, my name is Aaron, Aaron McManus. Uh, I work at Oriole Restaurant here in Chicago. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to do this. Uh, I've known Bill for two years now, three years maybe. Um, and uh, he's an incredible human being and motivates me and makes me feel lazy when he walks across the country and does things like that To uh, <laughs> So all I do is taste wine for this. So that's uh, the least I can do, um, but it really is, um, I'm so happy to be here um, and raise some money for, uh, for Parkinson's research. So uh, to my left here is Fernando Batetta. Um, Hi everyone. Friend. Thank you so much, Bill and Aaron. Uh, my name is Fernando Batetta. I'm a master sommelier based here in Chicago. Uh, I work with uh, Connoisseur Wines and I've uh, been in the wine business as long as I can remember. I think I started drinking very early uh, some, sometime as soon as it was legal in my uh, native country, Guatemala. Uh, so I enjoy traveling. I enjoy uh, obviously drink, drinking, and, but most of all, I enjoy sharing uh, my experiences. And it's a pleasure to be sharing tonight with everybody um, for this great cause. And I uh, can talk about some fun wines um, we're really excited about. And to my left is Ryan. Thank you. Yes, hi. Uh, my name is Ryan Bolden. I am a champagne specialist. I represent uh, Moet Hennessy here in Chicago. Uh, just before this, I was the wine director at the Waldorf Astoria, also in Chicago, which is actually where I met uh, Bill Buckley. Um, learned his story, and that's ultimately why I'm sitting here in front of you today. I'm super excited to be here and, and help raise money and awareness for, for, for good causes. Cheers. All right. What do you think? Let's, uh, so should we get into the wine here? Let's drink some wine. I think so. Well, um... Wanted to sort of get you into the uh, tasting mood. I hope you've opened uh, your bottles. You may open all three if you wish. Uh, we've poured all three wines out. So uh, to uh, from your left to my right, we're starting with the Pique Full de Pinay, which is the white wine, easy to identify. Uh, the reason why I chose this wine, and as you can see, this is a pretty you know unusual grape. Um, Pique Full in French means Pique means to um, to slap or to just to, to pick like that sound and peel, pull his lips so it's a lip smacking wine this lip smacking grape and it's from the area of Pinay. so we're talking about southern part of france um i remember uh living in france and you know tasting all these different grapes and it was very confusing and it can be too many 
Um, and we wanted to do something that's outside the maybe Chardonnay, Sauvignon Blanc, or other grapes that, that um, are very common coming out of France. So I don't know, this is a very ancient grape. Um, it has quite history, it has different names. So if you're like looking at this wine and you wanted to um, taste along with us, we poured it into uh, a pretty white wine glass. We have three different, you don't have to do this, but it really is a way to appreciate the different grapes. So one of the things I think that when, when we were selecting the wine, Ryan, tell me like what was the aromas and the flavors that you were you were kind of thinking yeah. of? So um, when I'm you know when I'm sort of tasting through wines, uh, I, I first thing I like to look for is, is fruit. Um, so what do I start with? Uh, specifically for white wines, I like to start with citrus. Um, I like things in this wine. Uh, I get lots of like lemon and lime. Um, Next thing I would go to is sort of like orchard fruits, uh, lots of pear and green apple. Um, also touching on, on, I mean, you can't necessarily, you know, we could discuss smelling minerality, um, which is not something I'm suggesting you can do, but this wine does have a very distinct. It, it is, you know, I, um, so the, the name, it, it's like, it's a confusing label, but the, the very top says Le Pied Maran, which translates in French to um, sea lights. So it's, it's a very coastal region. So we're talking about the Mediterranean and they mostly grow red grapes here. Uh, majority are, are red because it's very sunny, it's very hot, but in this instance you have these, these white grapes and being this close to the, the sea, you do pick up sort of that aroma, the salinity. Um, sometimes you can either smell it where it's kind of like briny or you can kind of pick up sort of the, like that wet chalk or wet pebbles. I know it's, it's a sommelier favorite thing to kind of bring up these strange aromas, but you know, the wine is very clean. So first of all, we like it because it's um, it's unoaked, it's crisp, it's dry, right? And all those uh, fruits that you were mentioning uh, really pop out of the glass. So it's kind of like a lemon, green apple tart on the nose. Like lemon oil. You, you don't know. get any of the oak. Like what is this grape? Um, I don't know, what other grapes do you kind of con compare this to? I mean, when it's such an obscure grape to begin with, but I think it's amazingly delicious. But I kind of go to other obscure grapes uh, in the world, uh, something like a Chocolina from Spain or even like a Muscadet kind of from uh, from another part of France in the Loire Valley um, that has that kind of saline right on the coast uh, and really like clean, crisp wines that I think this also represents. Um, I also think you get kind of a slight like nutty quality from it, um, just a little bit of that like peanut shell or like a beer foam quality to it uh, that I think is uh, underlying but absolutely present. It, yes, too. sorry. No, no, I was going to say it's fairly. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll you got to talk. Uh, it feels fairly rev reminiscent of of certain styles of Chardonnay. Also, I guess that would be sort of like a bridge wine for for people who don't you know have peak pools super accessible. Um, it kind of drinks like a, like a leaner style of Chardonnay from like a cooler climate, uh, more lees driven, not super oaky, you know, it's in that like tart, more citrus, French, French, Chardonnay exactly. Style. Yeah. French. And that's, ex that's exactly what I was going to say is that the, these grapes are fairly neutral, so they don't have a lot of aromatics. So if you're looking for flowers or something sort of very fruity, um, this wine is more like delicate. It's, it's more about when you try it, it hits your palate with a, a lot of brightness, right, city. And that's similar to like Chablis, right? I think we were talking about that earlier, that yeah. it's, it's like, it's a French unoaked style Chardonnay, which is a birthplace. And it's also very obscure because you can, you can put it into this realm of um, coastal grapes. And I mean, what would I would, you know, why would I drink this? Is This is just reminds me of summertime. It reminds me of app like appetizers, things on the plate. And we often talk about, some ways like pairings and you want things that grow together go together so in, in this case i mean in the cheese realm I, I i see some manchego which is like basque country it's very coastal it's sheep's milk that type of uh pairing with these wines is great because this wine doesn't overpower right because we don't overpower the french things like olives are fantastic things that are salty are fantastic it's a it's, you know every day goes down easy kind of um white wine yeah i mean we talked right on the coast too like this is absolutely kind of the shellfish seafood wine too if you had the oysters or uh crabs on a like half a like chilled crab i think this would be an amazing pairing even like things like ceviche which are like very citrus driven too matches all the citrus in the wine so i think it'd be really really pretty so if you have some of this wine poured save it 
and let it warm up in the glass. This is something I often say is that we drink our white wines way too cold. And if you pull, pull this out of the refrigerator, it, it just kind of covers the, the, the flavors, the aromas. So what I do is let it sit in the glass, come back to it in 10 minutes. As it warms up, it'll taste better. And also just in, in general, these white wines, you can keep um, open for several days because they're, they're very fresh, they're young. They don't necessarily oxidize as quickly as older ones. And the, and the reason it doesn't have oak is that it's really meant to be consumed in the first year or two that you buy it. So sometimes people ask me, do I age this? And I say, not really. If you have this bottle open um, it, for two weeks in your refrigerator, you need more friends. Uh, because you need to have this bottle consumed in two days. It'll be delicious, but it really is at the beginning you know, while you're cooking. Um, would I pair this with lobster? Maybe not. You know, you could, but if you're buying lobster tail, you know, go go with white burgundy, go with something crazy. This is just a fun white wine. Um, really wanted to start with something that would brighten the, the tasting, but save it so you can come back to it. So, so with our tastings, we like to compare, and that's, I think, would be um, a great great way to do it. Is there like a, what do you think, uh, serving temperature, like most appropriate serving temperature on this? Uh, time of so instead of being like ice cold, yeah. I would do uh, chilled, well chilled. But, you know, well chilled, the temperature, we're talking about 42 to 45 degrees. And like, I know my, my Fahrenheit, but take it out of the refrigerator and then don't put it back in, you know, it's just so it opens up a little bit more. Don't necessarily have to bring it down to almost like freezing. But some people like it like that way. And you know, if it was hot outside, I'd probably do it. I was gonna say, whatever temperature you like drinking your wine at is the temperature you should drink your wine at. Yeah, put some uh, ice in it if you want. <laughs> nice. Um, and with that, so if you any questions, save them for later. Um, I'm gonna pass the baton off to um, Ryan and talk about the- Pinot, let's Pino chat about Pinot. And Ryan, can I interrupt just for a second? We have a question on tasting methodology yeah. um, in general. Like, uh, can you share with uh, the audience here kind of the methodology to taste through the wines at, at a high level. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about the things that I, I look for, you know, my, my sort of check down system, like, um, you know, I look for, I start with fruit, then I go to non-fruit. Then I think of like, you know, earthy things, things that are that are derived from, from terroir, from the area. And then I, I like to think about, you know, whether there's wood smells. In terms of, of actual tasting, you know, for structural elements of wine, I like to uh, I like to start. It's it's S T A A B B L C is what I have in my mind. <laughs> you got that? It's easy. Yeah, it's that easy. <laughs> uh, sweetness, you know, sweetness, sweetness is where I start. Tannin. We don't talk about uh, you know tannin is, is just another acidity in, in wine, but it's uh, derived from from you know grape skins, which we don't necessarily talk about with white wines. Um, acidity would be next. Alcohol. Uh, then then I like to consider the body of the wine, whether the wine is balanced, whether it's complex. Um, you know, that's that's sort of my check down system, which I've actually, I learned from this gentleman. Uh, well, <laughs> and, and, and it's basically what it said, it's like, you, you look at it, you smell it, and then you put it in your mouth, and then your mouth tells you like all those things, right? Yep. Is it dry, is it sweet, is it like, is it, like blousy, meaning like it doesn't have any acidity? Um, does it have any uh, weight? So, so we talk about like wines that are light bodied and full body. I would call this a light body wine. It's not high alcohol and that alcohol feeling sometimes feels like creamy or uh, like whole milk versus like skin milk or yeah. something. So that's, I, that's kind for, of for body for me, I always consider like somewhere in between like water or like like chocolate milk, like big, you know, rich, yeah. like Napa That'd be like a Napa Valley. Valley. Exactly. 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 Olive oil, you get that flavor. Yeah. Yeah, yes. this is, yeah. this is in my mouth is like watering. I want to eat something with this and we have plenty of food, but that's the idea, you know, start off with that. Yeah, great, thank you, perfect. So, uh, to Pinot Noir. Um, so wine number two, wine number two is, uh, it's called Fox and the Flock. 2018 is the vintage, you can yeah, hold it up if you'd like. Um, Pinot is, Pinot is a French, Grape varietal. Um, it is derived. Uh, the, the name Pinot is derived from the French term for pine cone, uh, which is um, uh, talking about the, the, the cluster, shape, yeah. the cluster of the the, the grapes. Um, you know, typically Pinot Noir is a is a thinner skin grape varietal. Uh, it tends to it tends to bud early, tends to ripen early. It thrives in in cool climates. Um, you know, places that can sort of elongate that, that, that growing season. So places like Burgundy, 
um, you know, Australia, New Zealand, Italy, uh, certainly the United States, north coast of, of the United States, um, in, in cooler pockets of, of, you know, like Carneros or, or um, Russian River Valley, for example, even like Central Coast, a little further south. Um, also to this wine, it is, it is varietally labeled Pinot Noir. Uh, it is also appellated as California. It's just, it's just California appellated, um, which is suggesting a couple things. So it means that they're sourcing fruit for this wine from, from all over for different reasons. You know, they're using some, some Pinot for uh, some, some cooler climate places for more structural components. They're also using some, some riper Pinot Noir for, for more fruit and body. Um, also, this has a little bit of some other stuff, so a little Barbera, uh, a little Merlot, a little Petite Syrah, like 2% Petite Syrah, 2% Syrah, um, which, which just gives you more sort of mid palate and more structural kind of elements. Um, it has, it's, it's, you know, 13 and percent alcohol, which is not, you know, it's in that, that moderate, moderate plus kind of, kind of level. Which is um, expected, like in yeah, California, California you're for get sure. some, some fruit. Yeah. Um, I mean, what do you guys, what do you smell? What do you, uh, Aaron, Aaron, like, it's great at tasting. I mean, for this one on the nose, like, uh, Ryan was saying for white wines, he starts out on like, uh, citrus into orchard fruit into, uh, into some tropical notes. Um, I think red wine's a little bit easier to identify. It kind of goes like red, uh, dark, uh, or, and then blue. Like, uh, and so is this a red fruited wine, a dark fruited wine or a, a blue fruited wine? And Pinot Noir for me is always more of that red fruited wine. I think you get that cherry. I think you get strawberry, like almost yeah. like preserved strawberries in this one. Um, I think you see that uh, a little almost like pomegranate. It's just really bright redded. Um, I, I do something like, so I look at these two wines and I have the, the Pinot Noir and then the, the other grape, this Grenache Syrah. And based on the color, I kind of call the fruit. Yeah. It's, just, it's just so easy. So when I see this, like if I was in a restaurant and I'm ordering a beer, like I see something light, I know it's going to be still light. I see something really dark. I know. So this is the same thing. You see this, automatically people go like it's very light, probably fruits, raspberries, strawberries. And your mind absolutely yeah. plays tricks on you too. You look at it and immediately yeah. you go to that fruit structure yeah. too. Uh, we were talking about no wood influence into the, the pick pool here. I think you are starting to see some, some wood influence. And if it spends a little time in barrels, it does affect the flavor of it. It adds flavor to it, um, specifically kind of uh, baking spices, those things that you really only bake with, uh, nutmeg, cinnamon, allspice, vanilla, things like that are yeah. flavors you get uh, when a wine is spend some time or see some wood here. And I absolutely think that this wine does. This wine in the lineup is the the yum, right? It kind of meets the the corner of is it yummy? Tangy and <laughs> angular. It's tangular. It's it has <laughs> it's easy to drink, and I think we also recognize that Pinot Noir is, is a growing grape. I mean, 15, 15 years ago, I mean, it was hard to sell Pinot Noir, and now many people are familiar with it. Some people are like identifying whether they they like it, they don't. But it's a very like suitable wine. I I would love this. So if I talk about pairings or yeah. food, Thanksgiving, right? You have, well, you should, maybe not having all your family over, maybe that's like a little bit of break, but I would say, you know, this is something my, my mom would like, my dad would like, my sisters, and then myself, like I was like, I like Pinot, and it goes with a lot of things. So it just goes with uh, dark meat, light meat, vegetables. It's very, um, very versatile, right? Fish, that's why a lot of the times it feels like it's the common pairing in, in a menu. Um, it, it is a grape that can be paired with many things, but it, it also is finicky, right? It depends where you grow it. As to your point, this is California, and what I smell in the glass is California sunshine. Yeah. It's ripe, it's easy to drink, it's uh, easy to pronounce. Uh, I mean, so we gave, you, <laughs> we gave you two crazy grapes, and the middle is like the, the fox in the was fox in the fox. Fox in the fox. It's just because that's what we want something comfort and you enjoy and it's definitely between these and these we'll talk about them later contrast about what we say new or old world. yeah so we had a couple of questions on the smokiness and uh what's causing the smokiness or uh you know in this you know and 
Um, what is the spicy aroma in the Pinot? So a lot of questions around these kind of flavor components that you're talking about. So I think that is the wood influence here that I was talking I, about a little bit earlier. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, this clearly had some toasted like char barrels to it. So you, that gives it that, that, that intense like spice notes, all those like baking spices I was talking about earlier. But I actually, when we first tasted this together, uh, we did talk about how much of like the kind of cedar smoke quality yeah. there was. Yeah. Um, and I think that is coming from the wood influences. The well. newer the wood, the more flavor aroma it's going to give you, right? And so if you if you put a wine in a new oak barrel, you're going to get a lot more of those vanilla flavors, the cinnamon, the nutmeg. The older the wood, the more use it is, it's going to be much softer. Okay. Um, also, here's a question about glassware. So um, everybody's noticing the fancy glasses here. <laughs> Does glassware matter? And uh, is there any comments you guys can make on the feel free effect of glassware? Yeah. Okay, in my, in, my, in my glass, I, I drink, um, depends, during the week, wines that don't, uh, glasses that don't break, because that my kids knock them over <laughs> all the time. And the weekend, I, I, I bust out the nice stuff. It really depends. Um, some grapes are more aromatic than others and do enjoy more air. So Pinot Noir is a grape that if you put it in this large glass, it's usually a Pinot Noir or any thin skin grape, like, Nebbiolo or Sangiovese, um, often you might see this, this shape in, in those type of uh, barrels is, you know, it allows you to smell more and where white wines, you really want to like keep the, the wine colder and kind of concentrate those aromatics. Um, what you, the basics is you have a stem, right? I start there because if you hold it from the bulb, you're, you're going to warm up the wine. You're gonna also put your fingerprints over it. Like it's okay to taste it. You don't like some ways that hold it from the the base. Uh, you, you call them something else, but it's like, <laughs> obviously it's just it, it's just have a nice glass. Um, I do like the thin glass, so we really thick glasses. Um, it feels weight of everything. Yeah. It's just nicer. I mean, would I spend money on these like Zaltos? You know, you can if you, if you really enjoy wine. Um, if you drink, you know, on occasion you just want to have them as decoration, then it's not worth it. But it, it, it definitely does change sort of the feel and the, the aromatics of the wine, how it hits your mouth. Yep. The only thing that I would add to that is, uh, yes, there is uh, some importance to the glassware, but most importantly is that it's clean and it doesn't smell weird. Uh, That's true. Those because, are because that's actually, I always smell the wine and it smells like dishwasher or and something. And so that is really the only thing that can actually really ruin your experience. It doesn't matter how fancy the glass is, how thin or delicate it is. It really matters that it is actually a clean glass that Polished. doesn't smell weird um, because yes. then you can look through it and it, it won't actually affect the smell or taste of the actual wine inside of it. If you're only using one wine, one glass at home, um, it's okay to pour in the same glass, just rinse out with the, with the same wine. Because to your point is that in a wine tasting, I've, I've been many times people want to rinse with water and the water changes the flavor for the next glass by adding that different pH or chlorine yep. or the aromas. So even if you were like tasting in, in, uh, at the winery and they give you one glass and you, they'll be like pour, swirl, dump it out. And so you, what you're doing is priming the glass and then pour again in the same. But because people feel a little uncomfortable sometimes in my house when I open like six wines and I'm giving them the same glass. I'm like, I'm not cleaning. Six <laughs> I just pour in the same glass, just rinse it, dump it, and then you're ready to go. Okay. One other question. So the first wine we tried, Pitbull, it was 100% that varietal. This, as Ryan mentioned earlier, uh, Pinot is also a blend of other grapes. Is a blended wine considered inferior or what's the point of blending? Good question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you, I actually have a blended wine coming in just a second, so a strong uh, we'll hop on that uh, right now. Um, it depends is the easiest answer, but the, the truth of the matter is no. Blending wine does not uh, make it inferior. There are some grapes that are symbiotic and uh, very complementary to each other, and putting those together actually is sometimes a lot better than actually just making a single varietal wine uh, from that. Um, they play nicely together. Um, sometimes the uh, in, in the in area of Rome, we were talking about, um, sometimes you plant different varieties in the same place because uh, you're trying to hedge your bet a little bit. You're trying to uh, um, make sure that uh, 
all the different grapes uh, ripen at different times and uh, and bud at different times. So essentially, you're you are trying to if Syrah doesn't have a great year that year, you still have a whole bunch of Grenache that did really well, or you have some Movedra that you can kind of uh, bolster the wine with. So the answer is no, in my opinion. I don't think there's anything wrong with blending wines together, and sometimes it's a lot better uh, than than it can be. I, actually, the, that's great, but. If you look at all the wines of the world, very few that are 100% one grape. Like mo the mono varietal in the world is, is something new because it's really difficult to make one wine from one grape. So historically, like Rioja is a blend, Chianti is a blend, you would have blends in the Rhone Valley, you would have blends in Bordeaux. And all this because they grow many grapes. And this goes back like, this is geek, but 200 years ago, there were thousands more grapes in Europe. Um, and, and they would always grow them. And if you're a farmer and you're just making wine for your village, you, you don't like make a barrel and put one grape in there and then you make another barrel and then you, you label it. You take all the grapes, because they all look the same, and you put them into the, and you make almost like a very light colored wine. So that, that has been very, very modern to do one, one grape. Okay. Modern, you know, in the sense of 200 years, 300 years, not yeah. at, at, at ancient. Perfect, thank you. All right. So, so on to the third one, I think. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so we introduced it a little bit here, uh, being that this is a blended wine here. Uh, this one is coming from the Rhone Valley. Uh, so this is uh, in France, uh, Rhone Valley, and then a tiny little appellation uh, called uh, Costier de Nîmes. Um, this is actually very far south as well, but not too terribly far from the Mediterranean and not actually too far away from where the pick pool came from. Um, it actually used to be a part of the Languedoc uh, and then in 1989 switched allegiances to uh, join the Rhone, but that makes sense because it is a very Rhone style of wine. Uh, in the Rhone Valley, Southern Rhone Valley specifically, they almost always grow uh, um, these three grapes in tandem, uh, Syrah, Grenache, and Morvedra. Um, it actually goes, Grenache is most important, and then Syrah, and then Morvedra. Um, and this is a blend of 70% Grenache, 20% uh, Syrah, and 10% uh, Morvedra. Uh, it comes, uh, I don't know, I mean, to me, this is, we talked about like more brooding black fruit here. Um, and I think this is a, I don't know, what, what do you get, Ryan? Yeah, um, I'm, this is what I'm getting. I'm getting a replay. <laughs> For me, it's it's you know lots of lots of dark black fruits, blackberry, Please. black cherry, um, some raspberry. I also, you know, there's a fair amount of like kind of savory elements, like some some kind of olivey kind of brininess. Um, and it is, it, you know, there are also a fair amount of floral components, like purple kind of violety aromas, like garig kind of things that would grow in the, in the underbrush in the area. Um, like lavender, kind of like almost like potpourri kind of thing, um, and those are the kind of also similar things that I would lean on if we're talking about you know food and wine pairings and things like that. Um, yeah, if this wine is in your glass, it's definitely stands out. It, it has just that a lot of people would sometimes call this earthy or gamey or uh, barnyardy, maybe a little. And it, when you mentioned all those herbs, so uh, I mentioned like. Earlier, I travel through Europe, and if you are in the south of France, if you're like in Provence, everywhere you look, there's this, this like brushes of rosemary and lavender and thyme and oregano. It's all over their food. They, they love the olive oils, olive trees everywhere. That really influences the grapes that grow there. And they pretty much like to leave the wine alone. Natural yeast makes the wine. They don't use a lot of oak because there are no oak forests there, pretty much. They're all in the north. And, and that's what you smell. Like, I smell this wine. So I love looking at it. Um, it's just dark. And if you want to remember one thing in, in terms of like what wines look like when they age, white wines get darker as they age, red wines get lighter. And so this is like purple, electric blue. It's very youthful. So the, the, the nose is black fruit, ripe fruit, young fruit then all those other spices, right? It's, it's really like coming out, right, olives. And then when you try it, I mean, this is a full-bodied red. It's kind of coats your mouth. It just, some would say this is sort of sweet, um, but there's no sugar. It's just that it's very ripe. Right, yeah. And that ripeness is what I love about it, especially now in the, in the colder months. We're Chicago, right? We're <laughs> having this heat wave, but 
Typically, this is what you want, like a stew, you want some chili, you want to like pop the bottle and have some like, like if you're a vegetarian, I don't know, have a risotto, have some spaghetti with tomato sauce and, and it just really kind of like feels comforting to me. That's why I enjoy this wine so much. And um, I mean, we gave you a, a wine that it's hard to pronounce, but it's, <laughs> it's it, what basically it is, just Southern, Southern French Grenache and Syrah, it's delicious. Anything, uh, anything else interesting about the village of Nimes or? Uh... So they, they, so I, I, <laughs> I heard this on, on the Tour de France that the city, so this is uh, from the, the city of Nimes in the south of France. And that's where they developed the fabric of denim. That's why when you read denim, it means from Nimes, the Nimes. Uh, that's not where they uh, first made the first jeans. Levi Strauss made that in the United States, but everyone there wore the denim. And so there's a historical there because there's a lot of work, a lot of cotton actually was being grown there. It's very hot, uh, very warm. And that that's a historically a beautiful, beautiful place. So I love wine because you get to talk about these places, the history, um, you know, where it comes from and what the names are. Um, but most of all, just enjoy it, right? Just to have a pour and a glass and, and see what you smell. Yeah. One of the things that I think, uh, I don't remember if we chose these because of it, but we were talking about new world and old world a little bit. And I think these are pretty good examples of it. And when we sommeliers get together and like to be about about that, uh, the, we have the new world wine here. But if you put your nose in what, it, what is, is, what is it, new world wine? so it's a, uh, so it is old world wine is essentially coming from Europe. It's coming from anywhere the in the world. Uh, what? The colonizers. The colonizers, yes. <laughs> the colonized. Um, and then the new world is actually everywhere else in the entire world. Because uh, these graves weren't originally here. So it's like these came from France and now they moved over here. They taste totally different. They do. I mean, and typically they grow in slightly more in warmer areas with a little bit more sunshine. And so they're a little bit more fruit forward. And that's kind of what we talk about. And I think if you put your nose in the Pinot Noir glass, it just screams fruit. It's so ripe and lush and fresh. Um, and then you go to the, the Costier de Nîmes and it's still, it's still really youthful and, and, and vibrant, but it does have a little bit more of those earthy components, those olives, those more things that are from the earth a little bit. And so I think this is a really good comparison of whenever you hear that new world versus old world uh, scenario, I think this is a pretty good example. So what about decanting? We were getting a couple of questions on that. You talked about the effects of the glass and the air and the grapes. Um, would this be a wine you decant? And just maybe some general commentary on when to decant and that type of thing would be really yeah. great for people. Um, sure, so my take is that decanting is basically taking the bottle of wine and pouring it into another vessel, right? Usually decanter is larger so that the wine can breathe. You need to just get more air, open up a little bit raise its temperature. So if you have your wine in a, in a cellar and the cellar is very cold, you, you bring it outside, you pour it in there, you let that come up. And then the third reason, which is probably the most important is that if you have a very, very old wine, talking 34 years old, it has, it has all that sediment, sediment that like falls into the bottom of it. And then you want to remove that. My take on, the, on that is I love to decant when I have uh, the time and opportunity, the wine will open up. But if you were uh, opening a bottle of wine for 10 people, um, maybe, you know, everybody has their own mini de decanter, but if there was, if I was in a restaurant and somebody ordered, uh, this wine and they're going to just two people, I decant it for them, let it breathe, let it come up to temperature, um, for that service. But then the table right next to them, if there's seven people and, and then they don't see that service, they might question it. But I, I explain it. It's like, well, each one of you are going to get one glass and you're going to drink it really quickly, let it open up. Whereas they are like sitting on it and I'm letting the rest of the bottle open up. That's great. Is there like a window, like a time window for, for certain bottles that you would you know, consider decanting and opening up, you know, whatever it may be? The, uh, if you're gonna decant it, I think it has to be maybe at least an hour before. 30 to 20 minutes, you don't really feel that difference. Um, however, I'm still kind of anti-decanting two or three hours before, yeah. just because the, the you, well, you kind of like want to watch the movie as it starts. It's like a really long movie. <laughs> if you get in the middle it's a good or at the end, you're like, what happened? You don't really know. I sometimes open the bottle and smell it and go, I like it. You know, decant it, you get a taste, you come back to it 45 minutes later, it's different. Um, but that's just me. I don't know. Yeah. I tend to agree. I mean, I don't always finish all of my bottles the same day that I open them if I show a little restraint, which doesn't happen enough, but I, it does happen. Um, 
And you can actually save the wine and put a cork back in it and try it the next day and get kind of a slower evolution of that too, to kind of see where, where the wine is going to go, where that movie takes you. I've actually, you know, also on like very old bottles, um, I've, I've decanted very old bottles that I felt like it, it made them sort of digress, yeah. devolve like, like too quickly. And so I'm not necessarily, you know, a proponent for decanting all wines. I think it's sort of, you know, it's, it's well in the, in those cases, so the really old bottles, 50 years old, yeah. 70, sorry if I seem so. <laughs> it's a world of wine. Really old. It's a wine yeah. is really old. The reason is they've already had exposure to oxygen for that many years. So imagine like you're, you're a sleepy bottle and you're in a black cellar, it's really dark, and you come out and somebody like pours you into another, it like it jolts the wine so much that after 50 minutes, it just loses all the aromas. Yeah. So that's why they do this ritual of like taking it out very slowly and like pouring it so that you capture, you try to capture the aroma that was there 50 years ago, right? Too much air will, will just destroy it. Make it uh, yeah. Yeah. All right, some other questions about this wine in particular. Um, can it age? You talked about 50 and 70 year old bottles, but people are wondering, you know, this is a heavier wine of the group. Uh, will this wine age and uh, how do you guys feel about that? I, I think this wine has all the sort of structural components yeah. to, to live a long and healthy life. Um, yeah. I, I, with that question, with anyone, I was like, where am I going to be in five years? <laughs> like, where am I going to be in 15 years? And is it worth it? This type of wine is, is delicious now. And it, it will be different in a year or two, but you don't necessarily have to hold these wines down for two or three years because next year there's going to be more. Most people like to lay down, my, my, myself included, like hallmark years, very like collectible years. Maybe it's a birth of a, of a child. Maybe it's your wedding anniversary. Maybe it's a, a gift you want to give someone for, and say, you know, if it's a good year, you can hold it down and kind of remember that. Because some, most of these wines, you just drink them within the first three days you buy them. Fantastic. And then food pairings or ideas on things to pair with this wine? What did you pair? Um, I mean, you kind of hit on it earlier, but I think this is more like hearty late fall, early winter cuisine. So this is like uh, asabuco or like stewed qualities to things. So I think uh, pasta dishes with like ragu, very heavy or uh, things is what I would so I would fat, do. Because yeah. this wine also has has tannin, you know, tannic acid, and so what's the what's the counterpoint to that is is fatty foods that helps, yeah. helps roast chicken and something fatty with this yeah. like a salmon with that you know okay great and then we've got a couple questions on how to store the wine obviously people opening three bottles of wine in a night it's a lot of wine Chug a load. um we've got a couple <laughs> questions can you store red wine for more than a day and how long will wine keep and what's the best way to store wine and that type of thing any advice for people on I, at home i put the cork and uh, back in and I, I throw it in the refrigerator so if you keep the red wine cold it sort of because it's a perishable product it will just feel that it, it doesn't lose all the aromatics. So five days, six days, and again, stress. Six days, you don't finish it. You know, you, you, you need more friends or somebody, a partner or a mission. But um, most red wines, the idea is to have less oxygen. So if you're down to like just a couple ounces, it's gonna evolve a lot yeah. quicker. If you just pop the cork and drink a glass, it'll last a lot longer because exposure to air is what you know, ruins a wine. Oxygen is the enemy. Yeah. And then we had some questions on storing wine. Do you lay the bottle on its side? What temperature should it be stored in? What temperature is potentially detrimental to the wine? Um, that type of thing. I mean, as Fernando was saying, like colder is better for the most part. Um, you don't want to get it to like refrigerator temperature for long-term storage, but like 55 to 60 is kind of what the recipe is for longer term storage. So if you have a wine fridge at home, that's what I would set it to, to lay things down for a very long period of time. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's- I mean, I'm, and also, you know, we age a wine on its side because it, it's, uh, it keeps the cork um, in contact with the wine, which, which helps keep the seal tight, keeps the, the cork moist, keeps the seal tight, which avoids oxidation. Because again, you know, oxygen is, I mean, it's your friend, but it's also the enemy uh, in, in terms of wine preservation. Um, you, so don't yeah. wanna, you don't wanna stand it up for 10 years. It'll dry out the cork. It'll and dry then, out the cork. And, and then, then air and comes in and exactly. you ruined it. Right. And you also don't wanna keep it 
uh, too hot, like, you know, the, the worst enemy is 100 degrees for <laughs> two, two days because it actually cooks the wine. Or freezing it, it's the same, same method. But keep it away from light, store it on the side. What are the flavors of a, like, uh, of a cooked wine, though? That's actually something that we should talk about. Uh, well, cooked, a cooked wine, it just smells more evolved. Like, it starts to get uh, nutty. It doesn't have the fruit anymore. Yeah. It kind of smells like, um, like dates and nuts. And, and well, that's a matterize because matterization is like burning. But it just really it will also change the color. So it will lose any of the color and it'll look more orange and, oh. and just funky. Yeah. And then you, you wasted all these years and you have to <laughs> dump it down the sink. That's the worst pairing. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we have some tough questions. Uh, what is your favorite wine of the three? So they're putting you guys on the spot here and I'm gonna facilitate that, so. My favorite wine is probably the Costier de Nîmes. I think that it has the most structure. I think it has those really beautiful olive components that I really like in wine. I would say if I was on a boat, I would be drinking the <laughs> Pic Poul de Pinay, what I was envisioning when I drank it. But tonight, I'm, I got to hand it to the, the, the Nîmes as well. It's, it's very pretty, elegant, such a tremendous wine and value. It's what I like drink in these cold months. And I, I'm sort of most pleasantly surprised by the Pic Poul. Um, you know, it, that, that, that elevated acidity, that's like sort of dry, zesty citrus. Um, and it, I think it, it does drink, you know, sort of, it punches far above its weight. Way exactly, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna buy a, another bottle and just like blind people, man, I, 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 be like, I, I had no idea, you know, people, I'm, I'm, I'm all in, you know. Um, it's surprising me in a lot of ways, for sure. So I just wanna take a moment, we're gonna kind of segue into question and answer period and, um, First off, I just want to say, wow, blown away by all the support on the uh, fundraising during the event. And I think we were already over $7,000 um, in a very, you know, in basically 40 minutes, which is just incredible. So thank you guys. Keep it coming. Um, you know, obviously it's going to make a huge difference. And uh, again, very humbled by your support. So thank you for that. And, um, now we're going to ask these guys, put them on the spot, put, the, put some tough Let's questions to them. So again, go to the Q&A portion at the bottom of the window, ask your questions. The harder, the better. These guys know what they're talking about. So uh, you, you get opportunity here to learn some interesting things. So we're going to start off with a pretty easy one. Uh, Fernando was talking about 50, 70-year-old bottles of wine. So we can guess he's had at least one 70-year-old bottle. But uh, they want to know what's the oldest bottle of wine you guys have had. Um, okay. I have had one bottle from 1861. And so I, now you guys are gonna like, I had one from 2017. 1863 is my answer. 1861, and I just had it this year uh, in Florida and I, it was in so much picture, it was a Madeira. And so Madeira is a wine that can actually age or hold its like flavor for a, more than a century, obviously. And, and I was just more perplexed on like the historic, historical like relevance of this wine. Like it's made it through so many, you know, world like modes. And I like smell the wine and it was beautiful. It's because I think once you try the wine, when you consume it, it's gone forever. But that's unfair because it's not technically a wine, it's a fortified wine. So a little bit of, of alcohol to it so it gets aged a lot longer. Um, that's the oldest wine I can think of that. So uh, at the Waldorf Astoria, I used to pour a wine by the glass. I only had, you know, I had one bottle of it, but it was, you know, we would only pour it in like ounces. It was a bottle of, of Madeira from 1863, which I, it was amazing. You know, like, I mean, super, you know, how, how unique opportunity it is to taste a hundred and whatever year old bottle of wine. Um, but after that, I, I, we also poured a bottle from 1930, which I was like always really into because um, it was from Reef Salt. So again, you know, we're talking fortified wine from southwest yeah. corner of France. Obscure, but amazing. And 1930 vintage, it was uh, Prohibition vintage, which I always thought was was cool that, you know, we were, I was able to pour wine by the glass that, at, at, you know, at one point in, in the history of our country, you know, alcohol sales were, were illegal. Um, Mine is also a Madeira, unsurprisingly, because those wines do age forever. forever. Um, and it was in 1875. Uh, so it got me beat, but uh, only by a couple <laughs> of years. Um, I mean, we talked about fortified wine, and it is adding alcohol to the uh, the, the unferment or like partially fermented uh, grape must or the grape juice. 
Um, and it's called fortified wine because it essentially does fortify the wine. Like it adds it alcohol, it adds body, it makes it more long lived. Uh, some examples uh, just port, port, Madeira, sherry, sherry. Yeah, those will age um, forever. They really will. They really, really will. Okay, great. So we're going to bounce around a little bit here just to have some fun. So lots of questions on wine temperature. So Fernando, I know you mentioned with the pool, the 42 to 45 degrees Fahrenheit, but people want to know if I have a wine fridge, what temperature should I store reds and whites at? What temperature should I drink the reds and whites at? Lots of questions on temperature of wine. So. I mean, we went, we said this in the very beginning, but I do think your preference should rule above everything else. Like there's prescribed uh, scenarios for whatever, but if you like your wine really cold, you should drink it really cold. If you like it a little warmer, you should drink it at that temperature. Um, I'm a big fan of like, again, like 45, 50 for my whites. And then I like, I like my, to start off my experience of reds uh, closer to like 60, 65 is where I tend to start drinking them. Yeah. So I use this uh, example. My yeah. wife uh, walks around with a hoodie in the house all the time. She's cold. She does not know what temperature she like raises it. And, stuff. <laughs> and so I tell her, if you want to try this wine, if you take it out red wine, it's going to be hot. And if you put it for five, 10 minutes in the refrigerator, it, it tastes so different. It's like makes it like kind of cooler. So as long as the reds are cool to the touch, it's often our uh, room temperature now is like 70, 72, and that's way too hot for reds. Uh, it just feels warm. And then in the, in the, in the summer, you get air conditioning, it's like 68, 70. Your whites also feel too warm. So I'm like, take those out of the refrigerator and keep them, they might sweat a little bit, but you kind of keep them, keeping them cool. Um, Cause the temperature thing, it should just feel cool to the touch. Cool. And then, you know, it's very chill. I, I would always keep my, my cellar, like the cellar temperature in that like kind of North fifties, you know, like 50, 59, 58. Um, that's, that's at least where, where, you know, where I was. Yeah, that's my, that's my sweet spot. 60, 50, yep. 58, 60. Awesome. All right. So we had a really great question. I think it's, um, are there any new trends that are emerging in the wine field right now that you feel are going to kind of change or kind of evolve to be standing the test of time? And then the corollary question of that was, where can I go? Uh, what resources can I look at to learn more about wine in general? So any suggestions on that? Any, any trends? Well, wine Insiders has a, a valuable resource. I saw on the website, they have a lot of information and like yeah. trends. And yeah. um, I think recent years, um, people have been looking for value. Um, so South America, Argentina, Chile, fantastic wines. And if you're going to Europe, go to anywhere that's south again, southern Italy, southern Spain, southern France. Those, those are the areas I think you, you find a lot of trends. Everything like that's already been famous, Bordeaux, Burgundy is becoming more and more expensive. So it's just going to be hard to, maybe the Loire Valley. I, I mean, I've always, I'm, I have always sort of been bullish on wines from South Africa too, which I, I think are, you know, a ton of that. Yeah. You know, I, I think that you can find, you can find classic examples of like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and, and Cabernet and Chenin Blanc and like um, really fantastic value. Uh, even, even sparkling wines from like Franschuk and, and, um, and, and because, you know, they're on, they operate on the Rand and, you know, it's, it's uh, your dollar can stretch a, a lot further in places like, like South Africa. Um, you have to be willing to, you know, experiment and try a bottle, see what it's like, compare them. Yeah, I mean, I think, and we're talking a lot about Southern Hemisphere, and I, it's a little bit more established, but I think New Zealand and Australia, I think there's some really fun things coming out of those areas as well um, that I think still add a lot of value to, to the product. All right, so a couple different questions kind of about that building knowledge. What does it take to become a sommelier and... Um, you know, what, maybe you could share a little bit of your story, uh, each of you briefly on how you got into it, your passion and, and all of that. I mean, so I fell in love with wine while I was at the Culinary Institute of America. Uh, I had every intention of becoming a chef and uh, wanted, always wanted to do that. And then I come from a family that doesn't really drink a lot of wine. Uh, so I had the one mandatory wine class I had to take at the culinary school. And I was like, wait a minute, this is delicious. Uh, <laughs> and I kind of never turned back. I, uh, I took as many voluntary wine classes as I could. And uh, I, I just kind of went hard in that 
that focus and talk to people way smarter than me. Uh, and then eventually started to learn, absorb some knowledge and just get better. And you get to drink a lot, which is fun. Well, I, I consider myself the former sommelier. Uh, I don't work the floor anymore. I, I did for many years. Um, really, a sommelier should work in a restaurant, take the wine, work with chef, decide on that. But if you really love wine, just find them, try, try, experiment. I caught the bug when I was, I was working with my parents in their restaurant and the mother would be like, try this, this goes with the food. And she'd start picking wines from Napa, from Spain. Um, and I love telling stories about each place. So you have to have a sort of passion for food and culture and history and art. And I think a sommelier is also like a broker for art. So our job is to help navigate the buyer. So. What's the, what's the art you should invest in? What's the good value? What, is, what do you enjoy? It's not what I like, right? So that comes to the, the, the money question. How, how much do you want to spend? Well, really, we want to find something that the end consumer wants. So we, be, we have to become almost humble and understand. So we study a lot. We kind of taste and taste and taste. I think I taste more than I, I should. Um, <laughs> And then eventually, you know, you, you, be, you can become a sommelier or yep. step out of it like I do because I sell wine, but it's, it's something I hope. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, for me, it, my wine was not drank in my house when I was a kid. You know, my, my, my mother didn't, didn't drink wine. So I, I didn't really get into wine. It happened organically just sort of like through working in restaurants. Um, you know, in, in 2008, I got a fine dining job at, as, a, as a front waiter downtown in Chicago. Uh, and I didn't know anything about wine, but there was a gentleman there uh, who was studying to be a sommelier who, who kind of, you know, he recommended some books, Kevin Israeli's book. Um, Windows of the World. Yep. Thank you. And, and really put me on the path. And then, you know, for me, my wife, in, in 2010, my wife was offered a position in, in, in Europe. And so we, we moved to Paris and, and that's where I caught, caught the wine bug, um, really being able to travel and like explore and like taste all these different amazing wines. Um, and then when I, when I came back, you know, ultimately when I came back to America, uh, my wife signed me up for my introductory sommelier exam, which, which funny story was taught by Stephen Geddes, who I mentioned. And then afterwards I spoke with Mr. Geddes and, uh, it's funny because we were talking about him earlier. Um, I said, Hey, you know, what, what, what are the next steps? What do you think I should do? What, what I want to be involved in the wine industry in Chicago, who should I talk to? And he, I, I kid you not, he told me, to call this guy, to, to, to email this gentleman. Uh, <laughs> and, and that was uh, yeah, back in 2013. That, and so that, he's that's humbling. been helping me. Yeah, you have to, I that. guess you have to find um, mentors. I mean, a master sommelier uh, exam diploma is difficult. And I, I'm touched by that. And I, I the same way, I, I have, you have to ask, pick up the phone. If you're going to be a someone, who do I have to, who do I have to work with? Who do I have to taste with? Uh, and you, you learn. I learned from this guy, I learned from this guy. We're always learning. All right, so continuing the jumping around. First off, I just want to say, uh, blown away by everybody's support on Fledgling. Um, we're approaching $10,000. Um, I'm going to kick in another $1,000 of my own matching money. So let's see if we can get to $15,000. Uh, I think that would be amazing. Um, so thank you guys for that. Um, we've got a lot of questions on global warming. We're talking about a, it's a warm day here in Chicago. I think it was almost in the 70s. Um, there's fires in California. We're seeing different trends in different regions in France where they're harvesting almost a month early. Um, how, how do you guys view that? And um, how does that affect the wine industry? And you know, any words of wisdom or thought around that? Well, well, Bill, we, we know that global warming is a thing. Climate, in terms of wine, we still consider stable, uh, you know, hot climate, warm climate. But what the global warming is doing is creating more weather, un, un, you know, planned weather. So there's more hail and that's, you know, ruining grapes. There's more frosts in the spring, which is causing the, the buds to not even flower. It, it's creating fires. So now we're getting this issue in California where Suddenly, like, you know, these grapes are grown right next to places that catch on fire all the time. They maybe would have thought about it differently. And then in places where they're just, you know, very cold. So, like, in Germany, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, 
you could make ice wine because it was pretty cold every winter and the grapes would freeze. Now it happens once a decade. Right. Um, so that is, is, is a trend that we're fortunately we're seeing. But in, in hot areas, when, when I talk about hot, like Australia, Southern France, actually South Africa is very cool. But if you, if you go to Argentina, those grapes are pretty consistent every year. It's just that now there's more hail. Now there's more winds. Now there's more also, it's fires not, in Australia. It's just sort of pushing kind of the growing regions like further north and further yeah. south, right? So I mean, like the you know the future of viticulture could be somewhere. Well, in... the grapes in Finland. There's a lot of sparkling wines in uh, England, England yeah. now. Um, they're go in terms of Argentina. They're going further south, yeah. like near Patagonia, because yep. it's just milder, um, and that's what you need for wines like this. Not not for this, but. Yeah. For, for your Pinot Noir, you want something with a long growing season. I mean, it's possible things will change too. It's possible we're going to need to figure change where some grapes were planted and yeah. historically, yeah. Will it be where, you, where you used to plant Pinot Noir, maybe you have to plant a hardier, a hardier um, like a warmer uh, grape that prefers, prefers a warmer climate. So, I mean, there's adjustments that need to be made. Um, there's techniques that you can change how you're growing the vine, how you, how much you pick, how you shield the grapes from the sun. There are, but it's a struggle right now and it's real. It's a, uh, everyone's trying to get better and everyone's trying to learn from it, but it's happening. Okay, a couple questions on screw caps, right? <laughs> are screw caps on inferior wines, are screw caps a valid way to keep wine sealed? Um, I know this is somewhat contra the, controversial. Yeah, we, we, have a, we, have a, we have very different, differing I'm opinions. I'm a Neanderthal when it comes to, uh, <laughs> to this. this I matter, love screw caps. Uh, you caps. take screw caps I don't uh, love to a picnic. <laughs> <laughs> you know, okay, this is what I love. This, this is awesome. I tell if you are going to the movies and you want to sneak in a bottle, screw cap. Uh, you go to a restaurant and they have corkage, screw cap. Because you, what if you bring a bottle that's corked and it's corked and you can't? If you are not going to finish the bottle, screw cap. Uh, a screw cap is, you know, they high end whiskeys have, uh, you know, the, the screw cap, the Stelvin. And people are fine with that. So if you're going to consume the wine within a, a day or two, if you're traveling, you know, you, like it's so convenient. I know that if I see a screw cap, I'm like, I know that the wine's going to be clean and inert, unfaulted. But um, there's a romantic part of it. I do I want to see my collectibles on a screw cap? I would tell the winemaker, no. You know, I'm going to lay this down. I want I want you to to leave the cork. So that's what I feel like. It, but there isn't enough sort of science behind no it's actually versus... proven that it's not that great yeah they, 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 they put wines and screw cap for 15 years and they're like maybe it would have been better to age it with cork yeah i just love the convenience i love yeah. the, the crack and then glug and then close and take it to the park and come back which i don't you know but... and for me I'm, I, I like the romantic part of, of opening you know un, unfurling a, a bottle using my corkscrew peeling off the label or peeling off the, the foil and, and opening a cork that way. I have I've had, I've had some, I love the romantic part of pulling a cork too, don't get me <laughs> wrong. Um, but I, I've had some middle tier like aging. I've had some six, seven year old wines under screw cap that I think are very, they're evolving perfectly fine and actually very well. Um, and so I think for short to medium term aging, I think that you can, it's, it's, a, it's, that pulling having a corked wine even if you've only had it for six years uh is still devastating when you've been like oh i can't wait i'm going to open this wine in five six years and you pull it and the only reason it's bad is because the closure uh screwed it up i think that there's there's a reason to think are, about some, i mean there are incredible wines that are that are you know housed under stelvin right i mean like yeah there are and i, and I think germans I, also, and austrians and Australian. new zealand's have really pioneered that yeah. but yeah. it's so it's a uh, jury still out on really long-term aging, um, I think, but uh, I think you can still have really amazing wine under, under Stelvin. All right, so lots of questions on this one, not to get political, but there's red, white, and there's rosé, and we can meet in the middle. Can you guys, we have questions, what's going on with the popularity of rosé? How, how do you create a rosé wine? Um, all that type of stuff. Can you guys uh, give us a little bit of kind of input on the world of rosé? I'll talk to on how you actually make rosé and then they can touch the uh, the popularity of it. Um, 
if you think about any any wine, whether your table grapes or Concord grapes at home, if you bite into that grape and cut it in half, the skin is the color or like a dark black color, and the center of it is clear, and it's a it's it has no color to it. So if you are uh, all the color of red wine comes from the grape skin. Um, and you can do a couple different things. You can either let the grape skin sit on with the, the clear liquid for a very short period of time uh, and only bleed out a little bit of that color. And that's called Saunier method uh, of making a rosé. Or you can have a red wine and a white wine. You put them together and you make a rosé. Uh, so there's a couple different ways to actually make it. As far as the popularity goes, do you guys have any opinions about that? Uh, yeah, well, it's been very popular in the last, you know, even five years. Uh, the, the tradition in Europe to drink rosé is early spring because, like you said, it's made very quickly, it's pressed in November, October, it spends five, six months, maybe three months, and it's ready to drink. And so that type of wine is not worth aging, so you drink it in the summer months. Uh, I believe you can only drink rosé while there's still light out. And as soon as it gets dark outside, you got to put that away. You got to grow up and be an adult and drink red wine. What about um, rosé champagne? Is that? Uh... Yeah, rosé. You have to. You have to be like in a mood, like all day. Oh, right. So it's called all day rosé, uh, all night rosé. I never seen a t-shirt. Um, if you drink rosé at night, it's your own thing. I just think it's kind of like it's like having I don't know cereal after three p.m. It's like you know, it's a funny thing in I mean, Europe. It, it's considered rosé is a thing you drink during the day, lunch wine, it's fresh, it's lovely. And I think in, in America, we've caught on to this, this lifestyle of rosé. It's pretty, you drink it outside, you drink it at parties. It's, it's really a lifestyle because people weren't doing that before. So it, it's just like caught on really quickly and, it, and I love it. But I, I do it in the summer, in the spring. Um, I don't, I'm not going to show up to somebody's Thanksgiving uh, and be like, let's drink rosé at 8 p.m. <laughs> it's for the day. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I concur. All right, so just to close it out, um, do you guys have any kind of insider tips? Uh, you mentioned some things on where to find value wines. I think that that's really a great thing. Um, if you guys have any kind of insider tips for people, it could be from what best corkscrew to use or you know, new regions of wine that are emerging that could be interesting that are similar to these or, or anything that uh, we can kind of leave people with before we close it out here. I mean, I'll gladly leave it off on this. Yeah. yeah. I, would, I would say ultimately, uh, my, my advice would be to trust, trust your, your wine professionals. Trust, trust whoever it is that is selling you your wine. Um, if you have questions, you know, if, if, you, if, you, if you're unsure, if you need a recommendation, these, it, is, it is our, our job, our, our, our passion to, like, to help you have a better experience consuming more wine, right? I mean, that's that's what we want. We just want to promote wine consumption, pretty much, yeah, in consumption in general. Um, so I would say, I would say trust your trust your beverage professionals, you know, trust, yeah. trust us all. Um, I, I would say the same thing, uh, the social media, outlets, there's so many uh, avenues, but if you're following mindset insiders, you are seeing what they're drinking, what they're putting out, it's usually, the retailer or the importer that's discovering things before the psalm um, or the retailer. And once you develop your palate, once you know what you like, you have to explain that. And if you like these wines, it's great to say, I like this wine. I like light, I like red. Yeah. Um, but then diversify. You know, don't always have light red. Try a full bodied and maybe a sparkling and something. So you have more options for your guests and I mean, I think to piggy, uh, piggyback on that just a little bit, like you have to find someone that you trust. And there, there's people out there that taste a lot of wine. That's the best part of our job is that we get we get to go to, we used to get to go to grand tastings. Eventually we'll do that again, uh, where we can taste a whole bunch of wine in one setting and we'll fall in love with something and we'll try to share that newfound passion to the people that are talking to us and that are um, that are interested in it. So find someone that you, that you, that you trust and find and make a connection with them and then you'll develop a rapport they'll learn they will learn your palate if they're good at their job and then they'll find things that you really enjoy all right last two things um you know people are really interested in what you guys drink at home you guys get this amazing 
kind of work experience where you get to drink the best wines in the world. But, you know, Fernando, Aaron, Ryan, if we just popped in on a Saturday and looked in the window of your house, what would you guys be drinking? Why do you look at me first? Uh, you guys, you guys I, I drink Chardonnay uh, for white and I drink Syrah for red. They're my favorite two reds. Okay. Um, I love light. I don't like oaky, oaky Chardonnay, but I love like fresh. It's just so, so good. Um, I, you won't find it in my cellar because I drink it. Um, <laughs> and then my, my other go-to is, is champagne. You know, champagne is just great, easy, all the time. Well, that's another question we got too, not to interrupt, but uh, champagne, is it just for celebrations? I think we, yeah. It's, it's in DP as well. <laughs> <laughs> you need it. It's also just a very food friendly wine. Like it has, uh, it has a lot of the same characteristics we were talking about. It has vibrancy and acid and it lends itself really well to a lot of different cuisines, I think. So I think it's- The bottles that I, that I have the most of at, at my, in my cellar or the bottles that I, you know, are bottles that I've collected in, in my travels. So I have more, you know, I've been to Champagne, I've been to the Rhone, I've been to parts of Italy. So that's, that's what I tend to, you know, have more of. But if you were to peek in my window on like a Saturday night, I'm probably drinking like gin or something like that. <laughs> you mean on a Tuesday? <laughs> uh, whatever. Which, which what are we doing later? This week, yeah. yeah. Um, so, question. Last question was, how can we follow you guys if we want to uh, kind of stay in touch and see what you guys are up to? What's your handle? Uh, I am Aaron MC43, um, or at Aaron MC43. Uh, I am not a good follow. Uh, full disclosure, uh, but please follow me. I'm trying to get better. Great. We have great. Content. <laughs> I'm uh, on Instagram at Fernando Batetta MS, and um, I'm also Fernando Batetta on Twitter. And I am, uh, it's at The Rotten Noble on Instagram. Uh, the Rotten Noble. Uh, uh, yeah. It's a, it's a play on words, noble rot, you know, wine stuff. Um, but I am a good follow, so, so hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, you know, Guys, thank you so much. Uh, what an incredible uh, breadth of knowledge you're able to share, and thank you for your time. So what we're going to do now is uh, Steve Zarch from our board at Uncork is going to read a, a brief uh, statement from the leadership of our two charity partners, the Parkinson's Foundation and the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And uh, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you for that. On behalf of the global Parkinson's community, thank you for your support of tonight's event. We are grateful to Bill Bucklew, Uncorked Adventures, and the entire team at Wine Insiders. They've done a tremendous job bringing together so many people to raise funds and bring attention to the urgent need of a cure for Parkinson's. Together, Parkinson's Foundation and the Michael J. Fox Foundation are committed to providing the best research, care, and resources for those living with the disease. It is through passionate volunteers and supporters like Bill and all of you joining us here tonight that we're able to carry out our mission and best serve people and families who are impacted by Parkinson's disease. So. All right, thanks, Steve. Um, you know, I just want to say that uh, nine weeks ago, this was an idea. And now we're sitting here today with tens of thousands of dollars raised for an amazing cause. Um, we all, I, I certainly got a lot of value out of this and I've been drinking wine for 30 plus years and I've learned something I learned a lot just being here. So um, a lot of thanks to go all the way around. I wanna thank the Wine Insiders team uh, for just doing an amazing job of executing on everything. Again, if you wanna stock up on some wines for the holidays, give them some, give gifts. We're gonna, they're gonna extend this through the weekend. So check that out. Um, I really wanna thank the three sommeliers for their time, dedication and sharing their knowledge. Um, you know, Ryan, Fernando, uh, Aaron, you guys were great and I really appreciate your, your time and, and everything else. Um, the Uncork Board of Directors, we're an all volunteer army. So the two Steve's, Steve Sergisketter and Steve Zarch, Heidi, my beautiful wife, of course, and uh, Christy McCullough, Mark Campolito. Guys, uh, thanks for all your time. But most importantly, I just wanna thank all of you, um, you know, we were left with no options for fundraising, like I said, in nine weeks, pulled this together. And um, I just really appreciate everybody's commitment and support on this event. You made a huge difference. I'm blown away by the support, even during the event tonight for your fundraising. We'll recap all of that overnight. 
but uh, just everybody should feel really good that we're just making a tremendous difference in the world and uh, raise that glass and uh, let's toast to uh, curing Parkinson's and to everybody's support. So thanks, cheers. <laughs>